Chair of CSIS. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to welcome you to our inaugural, inaugural event of Smart Women, Smart Power. The purpose of this series is to amplify the voices of women leaders in international business, foreign affairs, and security policy. It's an opportunity to highlight their contributions and their unique stories before an audience that is both deeply engaged and knowledgeable about these issues. This is an exciting new initiative at CSIS, and I'm so very pleased to be here to help launch it. At CSIS, we are proud to promote women and women's leadership. Half of our staff, our full-time staff, are women, and many of our programs are led by women. And it should come as no surprise that one of these women is also leading this effort. She is Senior Vice President, the Henry A. Kissinger Chair, and Director of CSIS's International Security Program, Dr. Kathleen Hicks. Kath, would you please stand and let us acknowledge you? Because we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you, Kath, for being a leader in this field and for helping CSIS bring these valuable discussions to Washington. I also want to thank Andrew Schwartz. Andrew, where are you? Our senior, right over there, our Senior Vice President of External Relations. Andrew has played a large part in helping to bring this effort to life and in developing the exciting Smart Women, Smart Power podcast series we launched two months ago. Andrew, thank you. We hope that each of you will download and follow this wonderful series, which I learned just now is what the, in the top 20 podcasts of, of all podcasts. We, we, certainly, <laughs> we certainly wouldn't be able to bring this series to you without the generous support of our sponsors and partners, Fortune and City. Fortune, our media partner and longtime host of the most one powerful Women International Summit, is a recognized leader in convening smart women and an absolutely ideal partner to help CSIS bring this effort to life. We are also thrilled to have Nina Easton, Fortune contributor, columnist, and host of chair of Fortune's annual Most Powerful Women International Summit. She is moderating this new series as well as our weekly podcasts, and you'll get to hear her voice every week. She does a wonderful job interviewing on those podcasts. During her time at Fortune, Nina has moderated hundreds of conversations with women who are making a difference in their field, and we couldn't be more th thrilled or couldn't ask for a better host than Nina to join us tonight. We also are extremely excited that now Nina has joined CSIS as a senior associate, non-resident associate. Finally, I want to recognize Citi, our sponsor, which has been a leader in the finance industry in promoting women's leadership development, both internally and externally through their Citi Women effort. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Candy Wolf. Cindy, City's Executive Vice President and Head of Global Government Affairs to say a few words on behalf of City. Candy. Thank you all. I wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us tonight for this inaugural event. I know that it's a busy time of the year and we probably had holiday parties, but I think it's much more fun to be here. Um, we were discussing that perhaps we needed some eggnog um, to enjoy, but uh, thank you for all for coming. City is very pleased to sponsor this new series with CSIS and with Fortune. Um, when we first discussed this opportunity uh, in this initiative with CSIS, I knew it was an ideal opportunity for City. As a global bank doing business in over 100 countries with a workforce comprised of more than 50% of half women, the opportunity was obvious. And as statistics show, women bring unique talent, ideas, and distinctive skills to the workplace. So Smart Women, Smart Power highlights women at the pinnacle of government and business and recognizes the societal and economic value of women as government leaders and entrepreneurs. So we're pleased that we have Ambassador Powers here tonight to kick off this event, and there's no better person to interview her than Fortune's Nina Easton. So on behalf of City, I thank you again for joining us in our first of, the, of many uh, other events in the series and our inaugural event for Smart Power, Smart, 
uh, women. And uh, smart women, smart power, excuse me, which order. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you again for coming. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS. It's very gratifying to have such a great crowd here. Um, I'm also pleased, again, to welcome you, and I do want to take that extra moment, as uh, Linda Hart did, and acknowledge Andrew Schwartz for his work here behind a room full of great women. Sometimes there's a great man. <laughs> And that is the case here, Andrew, and we appreciate that. Without Andrew's tireless efforts, we wouldn't be here today. Also, we're blessed to live in a country where a series like this is even possible, where there are women of power in the fields of international economics and international politics and relations, where there are men and women who can come together to acknowledge them and happily do so. And we want to use this program and this platform that we've built not only to celebrate the achievements of these women and to inspire future leaders, but also to draw attention to the needs of the many women who are treated as second-class citizens in their communities and their countries. With these goals in mind, there is perhaps no one better suited as our guest at the launch of this series than Ambassador Samantha Power, the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. Ambassador Power has had a distinguished career both inside and outside of government with a notable dedication to human rights. Her research on genocide and subsequent book on the subject won her a Pulitzer Prize in 2003, and she's often credited with spurring then-Senator Barack Obama's interest in Darfur and helping raise awareness of the conflict there. Ambassador Power has not only written about the world's troubled places, she has visited them. Most recently, as many of you probably have seen, she headed to Ebola-stricken Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone for a first-hand look at the international response to the disaster there and the disease outbreak. Although such a mission might strike fear in some, it was just another day at the office for a woman who began her career as a journalist covering wars and conflicts in places such as Bosnia, Kosovo, and Rwanda, among others. Prior to her work in government, Ambassador Power served as a professor at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, teaching courses on human rights, U.S. foreign policy, and U.N. reform. As many of you know, Ambassador Power was born in Ireland and immigrated to the United States with her parents when she was nine-year-old, so she represents the best of the American dream. Please join me in welcoming both Nina Easton and uh, Ambassador Samantha Power, the true embodiment of the Smart Women, Smart Power series. <laughs> Well, welcome, Ambassador Power. Um, Great to be here. A couple, uh, wow, we do have quite a crowd here. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to do, once again, promote our podcast. It comes out every week. You can literally take your smartphone, go on podcasts, and find it right there, Smart Women, Smart Power. And I also want to uh, reiterate our Twitter handle, at Smart Women. Uh, so please follow us. Please become part of the community and part of the conversation, because we are so excited about this effort. And it's so great to see you all here. Thank you. Um, one other uh, small piece of housekeeping, there have been a lot of thank yous here and a lot of thank yous that need to go around. One person I do want to thank, um, uh, Lori Burtman uh, of the Pennington Family Foundation was really key to making this happen. I want you to keep her in your thoughts and your prayers. She was in a very uh, severe car accident and is in the hospital in Louisiana, and uh, I just wanted to give her a, a, the, the credit that she deserves in helping launch this. So thank you, Lori. So, we've got this ambassador here who's an Irish-born Yaley, graduate of the Harvard uh, Law School, who grew up with the, uh, a, a single mom, a doctor, um, where I read that it was uh, the biggest sin was to um, uh, make dull remarks at the family dinner table. To be boring. To be boring. Um, she goes on to write a Pulitzer Prize winning book um, accusing the U.S. of others of being a bystanders to genocide and evil. So what happens, and that's the topic of today, what happens when this passionate, outspoken, uh, incredibly forthright woman becomes a diplomat, a diplomat at the United Nations? And shortly after she becomes a diplomat, um, the world frankly explodes with bad guys and yes, evil. Um, 
and I have to say, while there's lots of people disagree over the, uh, over the Obama foreign policy, what everybody, I think, can agree on is that there has been no one more pointed and strong and forthright. And in her, diplomatic. And, 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 <laughs> and diplomatic. Undiplomatic. But undiplomatic. Undiplomatic. <laughs> in her condemnation of, uh, of lawlessness and barbarism. Um, and I think many of us in this audience have our own favorite Samantha Power moments. For me, wow. it was the March 19th meeting of the National Security Council. Putin had just invaded Crimea, and annexed Crimea. And um, I, I remember this well because I tweeted it. Ambassador Power accused, oh, and then of course he offered this sort of fiction-laden explanation for why he did this. And so you, you accused uh, uh, Putin of showing more imagination than Tolstoy or Chekhov. Then you went on to say, a thief steals property, that does not confer ownership. How awesome is that? So, Ambassador, I'd like to start with Russia. Um, you've repeatedly used your UN position uh, to stand up to Russian officials, not only for the military aggression and, and disregard for international order, but also for telling bald-faced lies. Uh, how has that gone over? And I wonder if you could take us behind the scenes about your sense of how effective those kinds of words are. Well, there's a lot of propaganda. First of all, thank you all so much for being here. It's amazing to see so many people. Um, should come to the UN sometime. We have yeah. empty <laughs> Security Council meetings, you know, all these seats. Um, and thank you, Nina, for doing this, and Kath, and the whole team. Um, and it's amazing to see so many remarkable US public servants um, who are now part of uh, the non-governmental world, but are still doing such amazing work, who, who I had the chance to work with. So this is great for me. Um, but, uh, and that was a way of stalling, so I didn't have to talk about Russia. Uh, <laughs> no, um, what I would say is that, I mean, a couple things. First, um, the message, uh, I think, is received um, in the places where there are still ways of getting messages projected. And so one of the accompaniments and indeed something that preceded uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine has been a clampdown in Russia on media mm -hmm. uh, using all kinds of funky laws and strictures on payment and over taxation and uh, outright arrests and intimidation and so forth. So uh, the place that one, of course, would like to see one's message landing is there. And I think over time, because of the effects uh, certainly of the sanctions, you're starting to see more end of the, uh, the Russian uh, casualties coming back and families getting very upset about the number of Russians who've been killed in Ukraine who are allegedly not in Ukraine. Um, all of that is causing some ferment, but my message would not be landing there. I think for the Ukrainian uh, people, it, it has been a very important venue to show us being prepared to stand in public uh, and lay down the facts. I mean, there's more of a sense of relief uh, among Ukrainians one talks to than you, than you would expect. I mean, in other words, it's happening to them. They know the facts. They assume that right-thinking people are seeing and absorbing the facts. But, but when, they, when they're watching Russian television and seeing upside down land and how black is white and up is down and, uh, you know, that kind of level set uh, and that just basic truth-telling, again, which is being done by the U.S. government around uh, in all kinds of institutions, but because it's happening in front mm -hmm. of the Russian ambassador, it has uh, more salience. Uh, one challenge working within the United Nations is uh, how many countries just don't want anything to do with this. Hmm. Um, and sort of would just sooner Ukraine went away where they weren't, didn't have to take a position one way or the other. And so one of the things that I'm actually most proud of uh, in the life of this horrible conflict in Ukraine is that uh, we were able to mobilize 100 votes uh, in the General Assembly on the illegitimacy of the Crimean referendum and ultimate annexation. And that sounds like a, you know, of course you could. I mean, they're just lopping off part of someone right. else's country. Uh, but the Georgia vote, you know, just several years previous had only been about 20 people willing to step up uh, and actually put themselves on the record because they were afraid of angering Putin and so forth. So voice matters, uh, principle of course matters, and every country in the UN has an interest in the international order being enforced and countries not being allowed to do what Putin is doing. Um, but self-interest also drives state behavior, and so you've really gotta convince people that we're gonna be with them on the other side and that you know, in taking a stand 
uh, they're going to have allies, and, and that's a reliable proposition. So your audience you see as being multiple U Ukraine and Russians to some extent, and, and the international as well community. as the international I'm trying community. Trying to convince the international community to to stand up as well because. Uh, again, our policies are having an effect, but the broader the base of support for our policies, the more that will uh, put pressure on Putin over time. What did you personally do to get those votes? Well, one of the things I learned from uh, Richard Holbrook a long time ago, the late Richard Holbrook, who I miss every day. Uh, uh, I miss his phone calls, getting yelled at for all the things I'm not doing right. <laughs> um, uh, but. Uh, you know, there's a temptation to be very transactional in diplomacy, and uh, particularly when you, you're the United States and there's a lot going on, and you're part of kind of everything that's going on, whether it's the development goals or internet freedom or the peacekeeping reform or South Sudan, Central African Republic, Syria, you know, you're in everything. So the temptation is to go to other countries when you want something, and we want what we want when we want it, and, and often, countries are responsive, and that's US leadership uh, often really uh, pays off. I've tried to, and again, with Holbrook's counsel from a while ago in the back of my mind, really invest in the kind of, in just the relationship. So taking a bunch of African ambassadors to an NBA game. Hmm. Uh, I've done 100 courtesy, or 102, I think, courtesy calls on different ambassadors where I just go to their hmm. missions and you know, I go, my team gives me all these points, I'm supposed to ask for this and that and the other thing. And usually I just say, you know, what happened, when, when your country got independence, like, how did that happen exactly? And they're, they, you know, they're, they're but, but getting people to talk about what matters to them mm -hmm. uh, and not always starting Not with always what wanting something. To, not always, you know, I mean, we do, we want a lot. And, and the, the, one of the things that is so amazing about working uh, for the US government and can be exhausting, I think, for countries who have to take our calls the whole time is, again, the number of fields on which we're playing and asking other countries uh, to step up and with an agenda. Um, and it's what I think, you know, Foreign Service officers, I'm always telling you, it's, you know, you should feel incredibly proud at the number of asks we're making of governments about, you know, asking countries to contribute on a, uh, you know, gloves or chlorine or motorcycles on Ebola, or asking people to contribute a couple engineers for the South Sudan mission, or asking people to vote a certain way on a Ukraine. You know, the fact that our embassies all over the world are these vehicles for leadership on so many fronts, you know, is is uh, is really important. But but can't just show up uh, in those circumstances. You really gotta make, I think, respect and the dignity of these individuals and what they're going through. I mean, I went not long ago to the mission of Benin, and I just I asked the permanent representative to tell me a little bit about his village where he grew up, and, and he told me about it, and I said, well, how's that village faring, you know, given climate change, and because it's a coastal country that's been famously a lot of erosion. He said, oh, my village doesn't exist anymore. Wow. You know, and you just, uh, so if you actually get behind the positions, and there's a lot of positional warfare within the UN system, um, and the G77, which is a block that can be very challenging for us to work with, uh, uh, but if you disaggregate it and just uh, sort of try to understand what people are bringing to their jobs every day, their life experiences, their national priorities, which are often not ours, but if we want them to play on ours, you know, understanding better what's driving them is important. And how's that relationship with your Russian counterpart going? It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I mean, I will say this. Uh, there's a professionalism that also comes with uh, doing this. I mean, a recognition that unless uh, Russia has a great interest in the Security Council remaining the premier um, organ in sort of international order and the enforcement of peace and security, and so, uh, at the same time, we have these very dramatic confrontations. We've had 26 Ukraine meetings in the open chamber where versions, and I, I'm a former writer, so I take great pleasure in these <laughs> sessions, you know, and really, what can I say this week? Uh, but at the same time, we've had those 26 meetings. We've also authorized a peacekeeping mission to the Central African Republic, declared Ebola a threat to international peace and security, and called on countries to lift travel restrictions. Uh, you know, put in place an arms embargo uh, for Libya. You know, the, the work of the Security Council goes on, and so, uh, and Iran, of course, negotiations that uh, haven't uh, borne fruit yet, uh, but nonetheless are progressing constructively with Russia very much at the center of it. So you, 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 you call a spade a spade, you never pull punches, but you also recognize that there's a, a, a broad set of interests that we're pursuing through this 
right. this body. You know, um, I, this weekend I, I was rereading your book, Problem from Hell, and of course that begins with your uh, going to Bosnia as a reporter and, um, and really almost on, on the verge of trying to save lives, really. And um, you watched, uh, or you were there during the period when 7,000 Muslims were killed, 16,000 children. Um, and at the time, uh, the president, President Clinton, had said um, he'd warned about uh, the shelling of Sarajevo and there would be consequences. And um, as you put it, American resolves soon wilted. And I have to say, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but you know, I read that and what was back in the back of my mind was Syria, Syria today. Um, Bashar al-Assad's use of chemical weapons uh, and, and bombs against his own people. Um, and even if you personally stood up and talked about you know, industrial killing and monstrous crimes, I mean, your, your language is amazing, um, the use of starvation as a tool, uh, there is the question of red lines set and, not, and passed. Um, and uh, numerous U.S. officials uh, saying that Assad must go, uh, which of course hasn't happened. How do you, um, how do you answer that? Um, there's a lot there. I'd say a couple of things. One, just to separate this, the Syrian chemical weapons red line, as you know, in the wake of uh, the horrific killing of more than 1,000 people, including hundreds of children, uh, more than a year ago now, just after I got into the job, uh, the president did decide to use force because the red line was crossed in such a flagrant way. And uh, the result of him moving forward in that way was that we had a huge amount of diplomatic leverage such that I was able to negotiate at the Security Council the dismantling uh, of Syria's uh, chemical weapons program. Now, Syria and Assad find a way to be brutal uh, even as they've had, you know, uh, basically now 100% of their chemical weapon, declared chemical weapons program removed, uh, and most of that now destroyed, and the rest of it will be destroyed soon. Uh, but now they've found a way to use just household chlorine and stick it in barrel bombs, it looks like, at least on the basis of what the OPCW has recently found. So we're pushing on that issue. I think that what, what uh, you know, what, it, what I described back in the day when I was looking at other cases was administration after administration not sufficiently prioritizing atrocity prevention or mass atrocity response, not looking into the toolbox of US foreign policy that might be used on non-proliferation or on promoting trade, and not applying it to when it was, quote, merely people uh, you know, getting killed. Syria suffers no shortage of high-level attention. We have meetings with the president now uh, every week on the larger anti-ISIL effort and, and uh, on Syria uh, as well. And we have employed just about every tool in the toolbox, except one, right, which is making war against Bashar al-Assad mm -hmm. to bring about the outcome of the end of his regime or to bring about the outcome of protecting civilians. And uh, the president's calculus, I think many people in this room would agree with, which is the risks of that kind of military conflict uh, are substantial. Uh, the uncertainty of what that kind of military engagement would produce uh, is off the charts. We have certain devastation before us, which is why we, we're continuing. <laughs> you know, every day to think what more can we do? And up at the UN, you know, we tried to bring an ICC referral forward. We got a, a finally, I mean, it's, again, maybe sounds like a very small thing, but it's gonna probably save hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, we got the Russians to authorize finally cross-border humanitarian access. You can actually reach people who've been um, uh, in areas that the Syrians weren't allowing cross, so-called cross-line access from Damascus outward. Um, but, you know, whether it's support for the moderate opposition, now with the train and equip program as well, uh, crippling economic sanctions, uh, you know, the pursuit of an evidentiary base so that people can be held accountable uh, eventually, and a full-on effort uh, to mobilize other countries around a diplomatic political process. I mean, we, we are doing an awful lot uh, within the toolbox that in the old days I was describing it not even being opened. What we're not doing is going to war um, uh, to bring about the, the end of the regime. And so people, I mean, that's why it's, it's, the, it's such a heartbreaking uh, crisis. And, and, the, and the devastation goes well beyond even the statistics. I yeah. mean, it is just, and now the World Food Program, because we're out of money, we've spent more than $3 billion in humanitarian assistance, $3 billion mm -hmm. in this budget environment mm -hmm. to help the people of Syria. 
and yet the rest of the world isn't stepping up to the same extent. So now the World Food Program is having to cut off rations to refugees who are living in neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we, <laughs> there is no shortage of a desire to help the people of Syria. Uh, what there is is uh, a, a consequences calculus that the president has to do uh, as a responsible commander in chief, and that's where we've ended up doing everything short of going to war. So um, one of the tools in that toolbox would be destroying Assad's air power, which is what he uses against That's his war, population. Yeah. But, that, but some, you know, some even a former Obama official like Anne-Marie Slaughter supports that. And I was just wondering what your view of that is. I mean, I, I've just stated my view. That's war. Right. And, and the, you know, you can, reasonable people have a view about which tools should be used and why we should have used military force. But what none of us can do anywhere is, uh, and I don't think Emory has done this, uh, but is use euphemisms, you know, to say right. no-fly zone and to suggest that that's not war. No-fly zone, you know, means planes not being allowed to fly in the sky. It means threatening right. that those planes will be shot down if they fly. Um, so again, there's a, we have a very live debate in this city and we have this uh, a live debate around the world about what can be done and whether uh, you know, the, the benefits would outweigh the cost given the, the, the tragedy. But I don't think saying things like just take out airfields or just, you know, in, in some ways that's a, a little bit of a sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. It is war. It is war. And, it, and, and one has to be prepared to live with the consequences of how that might unfold if one takes that step. I wanted to, um, we're going to open this up soon to questions on whatever fronts you want to take it to. So I'm going to ask a few more questions. Um, UN reform, to turn the page just a little bit, was, was a big part of your purview when you were at the White House. You're now inside the beast. Um, what do you think most needs reformed in the UN? Oh, where do I start? There's, where do I start? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a beautiful, amazing kind of thing that 193 countries come together every day and argue and, you know, huddle off and decide about what kind of you know, business their countries can do together. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I think if, if countries could get along like ambassadors get along, uh, you know, we, we, we really could have world peace uh, by, by Christmas. Uh, <laughs> and so far as we, again, this point about dignity and listening, I mean, at least on our good days, you know, we fight like crazy too, as you've said and seen. Um, but the challenge with the UN is, uh, its rules and its procedures and its traditions have been evolving over 70 years. It's about to celebrate its 70th anniversary. And, you know, we know that the U.S. government, too, its rules and its procedures uh, often need to be simplified. Those of us who have dealings, we go to the DMV or we go and we fin fill out a financial aid form if we're a young person to go to college or something. It, President Obama has made a real, put a real emphasis on simplification, on kind of changing, making, trying to make, the interaction of a citizen, at least with the federal government, more like that with an iPad than with Pascal code, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's really challenging because these rules are built up over time and often you need regulations and deregulation and so forth. Uh, the UN, the challenge is to take anything away, whether an office that was created 40 years ago, maybe for some good function, uh, or a set of rules or a set of habits, you have to get <laughs> people to agree to do that. And just the, the vested interests and so forth that, get, that grow up over time mean that you, you, and given the G77 dynamics, there are more than 130 countries who consider themselves part of that developing world group, um, there's usually a pretty uh, sizable blocking coalition. Um, and sometimes it's not that, of the G, this, uh, that 130 countries want to preserve some anachronistic office. It's just that they want those other countries to support it <laughs> on some other thing. And so... As a result, the, there's just no one who can say that the, that the procedures and the structure, at just the time we need to be lean and nimble and you know, moving as threats move and, and, and so forth, Ebola being a very good example of this, um, the, just the, the human resources process takes an endless amount of time. We authorized uh, a peacekeeping force for the Central African Republic, which is in the midst of horrific religious violence. Uh, and we authorized it now, it, 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 it opened in September, we authorized it back in April. And despite giving the, the, I say the UN, but basically member states and the UN, all those months of lead time, uh, it is now only at 70% force size, and we're now, 
December, right? So we're, we're eight months after the authorization of this force. It's at about 50% civilian capacity. Uh, and, you know, it, it just the hiring, it, the inability to get experts deployed, the inability to even have rosters, let's say, of medical professionals or things mm -hmm. of the kind that we know we need for Ebola. Again, That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. That, drill down a little bit on Ebola. What happened yeah. there? Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just in terms the, of the main, to, to be fair, okay, let, 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 me, let me just turn a little bit from the bleakness of it all. Uh, this Secretary General has been committed to reforms, and he has, basically for it to work, he has to make a personal priority of a few, which mm -hmm. is what he has done. And most of those are going to come to you know, fruition by the time he's gone, you know, putting audits up online, whistleblower protections, uh, cutting staff posts that people were clinging to for generations. Um, so that's on the, on the kind of budget side. Uh, and human resources is going to require uh, that kind of effort, and it's something that's very much a priority for me. We actually have a nominee uh, to be ambassador uh, for UN reform who's pending, who's just voted out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and we're hoping uh, that uh, Senators McConnell and Reid will come together and, and confirm this person, because having a dedicated reform effort is uh, extremely important. On Ebola, though, Again, and uh, on Ebola, there, there, there are several layers to it. I mean, one is, yes, the bureaucratics, once uh, the General Assembly and the Security Council created a UN mission called UNMIR, the bureaucratics of getting people deployed quickly uh, are challenging to overcome. The Secretary General gathered all the heads of all of his agencies and said, I want no red tape. This is my priority. I want people seconded from the World Food Program to this UN agency. So they have hired people faster than any UN mission in history. That kind of leadership really has made a difference, um, but still slower than an NGO could. Mm -hmm. And if the UN is to add value and take advantage of the fact that it can pool resources from all around the world, it needs to be, you know, it can't be that Doctors Without Borders is getting there two or three times as fast. Um, so that, again, is just something that needs fixing, but there's just a lot of suspicion in some developing countries that this is a way somehow for the United States maybe to be uh, you know, trying to jerry-rig the system in a way that's in our interest. It's just, it's just hard to get so, a consensus And it raises the question of how the UN longer discussion, how the UN can remain relevant in these But, but let me, let me just, just add one thing, yeah. if I could, just sorry. But the, but the second layer of it isn't just the bureaucracy. I mean, in a way, to look at the UN for the Ebola outbreak or epidemic, um, I think is, is, it's a part of the story. Uh, but you had in those three countries health systems that had just never mm -hmm. been uh, maintained or fortified, uh, that region had never had an Ebola outbreak before. Uh, it also, Nigeria had had a polio outbreak, and it turns out it was able to draw on some of the professionals who had been used in the polio context to do contact tracing and so forth. That's one of the reasons Nigeria was able to get its outbreak under, under control. It just called up those, that same group of people who were 20 years older or whatever and, and, and put them back into service. Uh, but the weaknesses of those systems um, the, uh, the, the difficulty in social mobilization, the weaknesses of, in, of governance generally, uh, you can't blame the, the UN for that, right? Mm -hmm. Th those are national systems, and I think out of this, we all need to, we bilateral donors, need to invest much more in the global health security architecture, and that's why the president has just launched mm -hmm. this new global health security initiative, so that it isn't the epidemic that drives the response, it's also the cause of prevention. Mm -hmm. And Ebola will come back, or it'll be some different infectious disease. We need not to spend billions of dollars on this outbreak and then you know, kind of say, OK, we'll we finish with Ebola in 2014, 2015, um, and then see this come back. We need to repurpose a lot of the investments that we're making now in ways that are going to serve these societies in the longer term. Great. Um, it's easier said than done. Yes. Uh, I'm going to start opening it up to questions. Raise your hand. and. Um, I knew there'd be no shortage. Uh, mics will come around. Let's start with this gentleman right here and this woman. You'll be the next pink. I'm um, pleased I, I should say uh, just a couple rules. Identify yourself, uh, keep it short, and it has to end in a question mark. <laughs> I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. <laughs> I'm an Intel analyst. I think the next logical move for Mr. Putin would be to take the pro-Russian Transdenista region and make sure that Ukraine is surrounded. And I see our country doing absolutely nothing to prevent that from happening. Um, how about a NATO trigger force in Moldova? A NATO trigger force in Moldova. Well, um, 
Let me start by rejecting the premise. The notion, and I don't know why our discourse so often uh, does this. I'm, I'm myself guilty of it at times. But to say that the United States has done absolutely nothing um, is just a strange, uh, non-fact-based statement. Um, what we have done is put in place uh, and brought our European colleagues along to putting in place uh, very, very biting uh, economic sanctions that have caused the ruble to depreciate, capital to flee, uh, and are generating an internal debate in Russia uh, of the kind that we haven't seen there in some time, in part, again, because of the repression, uh, which silences such debate as it, as it arises. So uh, these sanctions are biting, and in the long term, uh, we are expecting to see much more pressure uh, on Putin, and th these sanctions over time we do uh, very much believe are going to affect his calculus. Um, it is not instant, but again, uh, I would not, if you, if you actually look at the number of sectors that are affected um, and the toll that they are taking, uh, it, it is uh, a very, very uh, strong response on the economic side. We are also providing a lot of um, non-lethal assistance to the uh, Ukrainian security uh, forces and, of course, loan guarantees and so forth as they try to get their economy uh, back on track. I asked about Transnistria. Um, as I was uh, about to get to, um, we are investing in uh, NATO and in dialogue with our Eastern European partners uh, and our Objective, however, is not to go to war. Uh, we, we are not actually seeking uh, to do things that would put us in a, on a pathway uh, to a military confrontation uh, with Putin. We don't believe there's a military solution to these issues, and so we are pursuing a series of measures that, again, we think over time are going to affect his calculus. Um, and so okay. we'll let the ambassador the move on yeah. right here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Please identify Powers. yourself. Thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to ask this question. This question. My name is Rita Herona Adkins. I'm a journalist. I write for Asian Pacific American audiences here in the United States as well as in Asia. You have been one of the most powerful voices uh, regarding genocide. And I'm referring, if you could sort of kind of throw back to Cambodia, a little known country with very few people, and yet you were one of the powerful voices. You did not necessarily gain everybody's approval, but you were one of the powerful voices regarding genocide. Okay, th that's uh, great. My question, yes. madam, is what are the lessons that we have learned from there? And do you think that the world has sort of kind of moved on along the path of your own uh, 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 um, vision about the importance of genocide and to human society? Thank you so much. Thank you. Lessons from Cambodia. Um, well, we've made, uh, not just us, but our, uh, also our predecessors in the Bush administration have made a very substantial investment in the tribunal uh, for Cam Cambodia, the hybrid tribunal, so as to try to ensure even all these years later uh, that the perpetrators who were part of the Khmer Rouge, who orchestrated this terror against the Cambodian people were held accountable. Uh, that has been another, uh, you know, kind of UN slash, again, a hybrid body that has not um, uh, produced results with the speed uh, that the Cambodian people have sought, but finally we've started to see the verdicts come down, and we think that's a very important part of, you know, not turning the page on the history uh, before there has been some kind of reckoning within Cambodian society. But beyond that, I think that you know, when you look back at mass atrocities over time, it's just very important to take uh, real leadership on human rights generally. And so in the Cambodian context, you know, we don't want to make uh, the standard for when we uh, you know, start to sound the alarm a genocide. We want uh, to work with countries that are coming out of years of repression uh, to try to ensure that they have freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, et cetera. And there have been real challenges uh, on that score with Hun Sen. Uh, I was got to travel with President Obama uh, a couple years ago uh, to Asia, to, to Burma, and then to, to Vietnam, uh, and, then, and then to Cambodia. And again, he's very forceful always uh, in dealing with the leaders of countries where uh, the rights of individuals are being repressed. Uh, my hope is that Cambodian young people get 
educated in what happened also about the crimes of the past. There's been a bit of a variable attention to that issue in textbooks and so forth, but I think there's been some progress there in part with the support again of, of the international community. Great, we have a question right over here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your leadership on human rights, um, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Amal Mudalleli. My question is on Syria again on the no fly zone. Uh, your allies would say that you are already at war in Syria, but against the Islamic State. Your allies say that you are already at war in Syria, but against the Islamic State. What can you do so that your policy or your uh, uh, campaign against the Islamic State does not help Assad, and they say it's helping Assad, and can keep the coalition together because some of your allies are not crazy about staying in if you're not going against Assad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we, we are, uh, I mean, the president has uh, indeed um, uh, launched a campaign to destroy and degrade uh, ISIL, uh, and that has involved strikes inside Syria as well as in Iraq. Um, I think it's important to note that the moderate opposition groups in Syria uh, have been fighting ISIL since December last year. And indeed, one of the reasons that uh, the Assad regime was able to pick up territory over the course of the last year was that they were fighting on, on two fronts against ISIL because they couldn't tolerate that form uh, of rule uh, and that level of brutality, and of course, against the regime who's is just a different form of brutality uh, and, and horror uh, being inflicted on, on civilians. Um, so I think, you know, again, this is not an easy. Uh, or a short uh, campaign, but over time, as ISIL gets degraded, and already we're seeing signs of that, you know, small towns uh, 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 and communities being taken back inside Iraq, um, uh, um, strikes against oil fields that they had been using and, and uh, oil refineries that they'd been using in order to profit, in order to fuel their war. Uh, strikes against uh, heavy weaponry that the moderate opposition uh, couldn't fight against. I mean, some of the weaponry, of course, confiscated from Iraqi forces, and, and which had been provided by the United States. Uh, so as ISIL gets degraded, that is going to have an effect also on the dynamics uh, in Syria. Uh, and that two-front war, uh, we're hoping, we're, you know, the, 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 as this thing unfolds, you should see the moderate opposition being able to stand its ground and benefit uh, in the areas where the moderate opposition and ISIL are bumping up against one another. Separate from that, on the regime issue, which you also rightly mentioned, uh, we have gone to Congress and, and received uh, support for a $500 million uh, train and equip program, an overt program where the moderate opposition will be uh, trained, and that's not just about ISIL, that's also about putting pressure on the regime. We don't believe there's a military solution. I mean, that's my earlier comments, I think, testified to this. Um, but we also recognize uh, that without more pressure on Assad, he's not feeling an incentive at all uh, to go uh, to the negotiating table. So we, we recognize, again, uh, that more pressure is needed, and the train and equip program, uh, we think, can be one form of pressure, but also if ISIL uh, uh, as ISIL gets degraded in Syria, uh, that also should benefit the moderate opposition. That, with this scarf, big scarf right there, yes. Hi, I'm Aliza. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is great. My question is about the current civil rights protests in response to Ferguson and others, and there's one down the street. Um, how do you think they're being viewed abroad? Do you think they're going to, both by citizens and by governments, do you think they're going to inspire change, reactions, what are your thoughts? Um, well, irrespective of the event uh, in this country, and this is of course uh, a transfixing one and extremely uh, sad s set of events um, where trust has broken down clearly in, in communities um, and uh, you know clearly more dialogue and, and more engagement is needed, um, but I think what I, what I see from New York, at least, um, and from trips around the world, is whatever happens inside the United States, whether it's you know, a long debate about health care and universal health care, which people around the world are very interested in, or the events in Ferguson or Staten Island, which people are very interested in, people uh, focus on our process, 
in uh, dealing with these kinds of uh, national events or national, um, uh, in the case of healthcare, you know, national debates, um, uh, as much as the events themselves. And so I think as these weeks progress, you know, to see uh, the Obama administration file a civil rights or move forward with a civil rights investigation, um, and and you know that as a kind of just looking at the checks and balances in our country, uh, you know, the, it's it's we we have never pretended certainly from the Obama administration that we don't uh, have issues of human rights in our own country that there aren't uh, difficult very difficult uh, race related issues in our country uh, and issues that need to be worked through. I think what we pride ourselves on. Uh, is that we face those conversations squarely. And, and that's certainly uh, what, I, what I try to emphasize in, in my dealings with other countries. Mainly, they just have questions. You know, what's next? How will this work? And, and um, you know, how we handle it and when we come together uh, in peaceful protest, as, as has happened around the country, that's an, ins an inspiration and it's also a model, um, and sadly a model that's not followed often enough uh, in many of the non-democratic countries within the UN. Before I um, go to the next question, I wanted to turn the spotlight just back to you for a minute um, because there's a lot of Where aspiring. Was it? It, was <laughs> other, it was elsewhere. No, I meant back to you in your life um, because there are a lot of uh, aspiring um, young women uh, who want to follow in your footsteps, I, I suspect, in this room. A um, couple things. What was the best advice you've ever gotten in your career? And uh, while I often get accused by people of, of being sexist in answering this question, it is on the minds of young women, because I get asked it all the time. You have two small children, and you're in a, in a crisis-driven job. And um, uh, what advice do you have? What, what advice have you gotten, and what advice would you give women coming up that path? Um, I will avoid language about having it all, or having part of it all, or, <laughs> or little bits of it all. Uh, but um, Shelly's here from, Shelly and I had our babies at the same time. We have perfectly parallel uh, parenting experiences, uh, the five and, five and two year old. Um, I mean, the best advice I ever got in my, in my life is not career advice. To have children, because yeah. <laughs> it's the best thing that ever happened to me, uh, yeah. apart from my marriage, uh, <laughs> which was tied in great, uh, better even. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he's here. He was coming, but hopefully he's not. <laughs> hopefully he's not here yet. Um, but podcasts, damn the podcasts. podcasts. <laughs> um, okay, so so that the my kids are are everything for me. I mean, I think on the professional side, probably the best advice I ever got um, uh, was from Morta Bromowitz, who uh, was a career ambassador at the State Department, ran the Carnegie Endowment before Jessica Matthews. Uh, my first boss in Washington when I was an intern here and he just his basic thing was know something about something hmm. you know that and I find this with young people that there's so much idealism out there now on college campuses but uh, he who fights every war or she who fights every war can sometimes fight none because you're spread you just want to save the world well, instead of that little sliver of the world that you could actually learn the language in or really mm -hmm. get to figure out what what makes a community tick and so I just urge I think I think you know going a little bit deep uh, sooner rather than later, uh, wh when I went to the Balkans, that was that passed for deep. <laughs> Didn't feel deep. It defined at the time. your life. It defined yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, and it turns out, you know, now when I work on refugee policy, I learned about even though I'm not working on Balkan refugee policy, you know, you just learn about the refugee system. Uh, you know, I, I encountered Russian diplomats there, and so in some ways, there's a, some previews for what I'm experiencing. I mean, in other words, if you take on one thing, there are a series of aspects to a particular issue, whether it's, you know, in the American public school system or, uh, you know, something abroad that then can, you can extrapolate from, whereas if you're doing, you just spread and, and there's a lot of, particularly with social media and the ADD we all have, um, uh, that temptation is ever greater now. And so, um, but on my uh, children, um, I don't know, I, I wasn't given this advice, but the advice I would give, uh, which <laughs> I'm sure my children's therapist years from now will be uh, saying was bad advice. But I talked to my, my daughter's too young, she's just two, but I talked to my five-year-old about my day as if 
as if he's a peer almost. And um, I thought you that, were your ambassador to the moon. Is I was ambassador. Yeah. Well, that was initially that was during serious CW those negotiations because I was never around. He said, "Mom, you're not ambassador to the United Nations. You're ambassador to the moon." <laughs> um, but uh, but no. But now I, I had a massive. He's just learning to read, and of course, no kid wants to do what they're not yet good at. Uh, certainly not my kid. And. Uh, and he, you know, he, I said, Declan, just try. These are really short words. I know you can do them. I know it's bad. You love baseball. Bat B A. You know, he goes, Mommy, that's it. I'm going to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's his. That's that's go. That's what passes for you know I'm nuclear. For you know, it's not I hate you or whatever. I'm sure I'll get that later. It's just that's it. I'm done. You know, this is this is. But but the sweet thing, by the same token, is he became. And I've heard a lot of uh, people in governments, the foreign the foreign policy communities, kids, uh, maybe others are, are are gonna have issues with therapists later too. But uh, Mount Sinjar, this effort uh, on our part uh, to help the Yazidis yeah. who are up on the mountains, and these these families with these children and. Uh, the hunger and the thirst that they experienced, and the effort to to help them, and you know, many uh, tens of thousands, uh, or thousands at least, getting off the mountain and so forth, now still vulnerable in very different ways. The women and girls, of course, enslaved. Um, but this, I, it was uh, when the decision making was happening. I happened to be on leave for a few days with my son, but I was on the phone the entire time talking about the Yazidis and. And so I had to explain what was Mount Sinjar, and I explained it to my son, and he just the notion of being up on the mountain mm -hmm. and stuck on the mountain. So he asked about it all the time. Um, and when we were at Thanksgiving, we were having this bounty here in New York with my own parents. Um, and he just said, Mommy, is there any way I can get my turkey to Mount Sinjar? Are they, you know, because I told him there were still some people yeah. up on the. So, you know, he gets his, his uh, can learn from Putin on the one hand uh, when right. it comes to reading <laughs> um, and disciplining his mother. But on the same, t you know, if you, if, that empathy from early and just bringing him into the loop. If I'm not going to be there, I want him to know to know it why for something the, the, important. Yeah, exactly. The stakes of it, it and maybe like maybe you're you doing can that. share share that that goal. Okay, we have a lot of questions. I know you've tried very hard way back in the yes. Uh, Voice of America Ukrainian Service Natalia Robert. Um, I actually would like to thank you from all of Ukrainians on behalf of all Ukrainians for being a strong voice at the UN um, to help us uh, fight the fight against the Russian aggression. And um, I actually have a very specific question. Um, Nadia Savchenko case. She's now um, being in the Russian jail, and she's being convicted of crimes that she did not commit. And um, Savchenko, Nadia okay. Savchenko, yes. the Ukrainian yeah. pilot that yes, was kidnapped yep. in Ukraine. Yep. And I was wondering whether there is a way um, to help her release, and whether uh, this has been a subject of discussions at the UN. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have raised her case uh, in my public remarks at least once, and I think maybe twice. Um, we have raised it uh, in Moscow. We now have an ambassador in Moscow, um, uh, thanks to that Senate confirmation. It's challenging to get ambassadors through. Has been uh, a little less challenging lately, um, but having an ambassador there has been very, very important. Um, basically, every senior US official who has an occasion to engage with a Russian uh, is is raising uh, this case both on the merits because here was a pilot absconded and and you know brought back uh, to Russia uh, and now uh, being charged you know uh, on these uh, in this uh, uh, <laughs> trial that hardly comports with due process or or anything but, but I mean the whole the whole thing uh, has been extremely troubling from the start but also as a uh, uh, as a, a testament to Russia's involvement, which it still continues to deny. I mean, when, when someone gets whisked uh, from Ukrainian territory to Moscow, it's just one more uh, uh, part of the evidence of the extent of the Russian involvement and the shamelessness with which uh, uh, those kinds of actions occur. I would note also uh, her case, rightly, um, is getting a, a lot of attention, but there's so many um, unnamed hostages also um, who uh, have just not been heard from and who are presumed in, in some cases uh, to be in detention facilities, you know, maintained by the separatists, uh, but also I mean, whose fates we, we, we just don't know. Um, and so uh, that is something, again, that has to be part of any 
uh, long-term uh, negotiated settlement. We had hoped that Minsk would allow progress on some of these issues. Um, and it calls, of course, as you know, for prisoner releases. Um, and unfortunately, just as with the rest of Minsk, uh, there just hasn't been implementation despite the Russian promises. What have you learned about the, how to capture the world's attention about atrocities, whether it's genocide, whether it's individual cases like this, whether it's, uh, it's very interesting with ISIS. Some would argue that it took beheadings on video to get the world, uh, certainly the United States, fully engaged. Have you given some thought to that? I give a lot of thought to it, uh, both because I want to do my job as well as possible and you know, secure the outcomes that we seek and convince other countries of things, but also because of my background as a journalist, uh, how to tell a story um, and how to uh, bring an audience along is, is sort of what I would bring, you know, or seek to bring anyway to, to every job. So for me, um, it has taken the form of trying, it's sort of as you're suggesting with uh, the killing of, of uh, Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff, um, uh, you know, those, the, 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 those horrific acts um, underscored uh, what ISIL was made of, what it was intending to do across the region and to Americans of all stripes that it encountered um, in a way that no amount of talk of statistics uh, could. Mm -hmm. And so, um, th that's, that's something, uh, again, absolute worst scenario in every hostage, uh, precisely because they are individuals and we can track their individual fates. You know, we're deploying all our diplomatic, as you've seen, diplomatic, intelligence, military uh, tools to try to secure their release. Um, um, but it, again, didn't work for, for uh, Jim. Um, what I've done in the Security Council is there's a sort of staid environment where things have been done for a long time in a certain way, uh, but I've tried to bring in those individuals. So we talked earlier about Syria chemical weapons. We went forward with an ICC uh, referral resolution that I mentioned, which Russia and China vetoed. And of course, had that gone through, what it would have meant was that people who had been victimized by chemical weapons or by barrel bombs or napalm or clusters or whatever else Assad was using uh, or for that matter, the terrorist groups are using, um, uh, would have had the chance to testify and tell their story in court. One of, one of the great uh, virtues of these institutions, these international justice bodies, is not simply potential deterrence and incapacitation of people who are seeking to wreak havoc in, in different parts of the world, but just the, the affirmation of the dignity of those individuals who, you know, they were taunted and said, no one will ever right. remember, or, you know, no one will ever believe you, and then they get to step up uh, and testify as to what happened. So Russia denied, Russia and China, but Russia was in the lead, ultimately denied so far the Syrian people that ability to come to an international court in their Sunday best or their Saturday best and, and tell the story of what happened to them. So when that vote occurred in the Security Council, um, I brought to the Security Council chamber with me someone who had survived the chemical weapons mm. attack and had actually been left for dead mm. uh, and his friend spotted his finger moving and then gave him a shot of something, and I mean, he was wow. literally out, um, Kuse. Um, and Kuse told me, I asked him in advance, a couple days in advance, I said, what would you, if you were going to the Hague, what, what is it that you would wish to say? And so when Russia uh, and China cast their veto, and I, had a, I said, look, the, you know, Russia's saying Assad didn't do the chemical weapons attack. This is ludicrous for all the reasons that we've long presented. <coughs> but, but if Russia really believed that, then they should want this to go to the Hague so that people could tell what happened to them. And here today in the Security Council, and I pointed up in the gallery, and I said, we have with us uh, Kuse Hussein, who's uh, survived the chemical weapons attacks uh, uh, outside Damascus. And he, he has asked me on his behalf uh, to read the statement that he would have given <laughs> had he gone to The Hague. Mm. And, and so I read it in his voice, and you could honestly, it just, what would have been just, oh, there they go again, another fourth Russian right. veto, it humanized the stakes of what they were doing. The power and of storytelling is basically, what you're saying. Yeah, in, in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's fabulous to hear you say this. I think we're about out of time. Do we, um, are we allowed to, I, you're on a schedule. So I'm going to ask you, and we have, I know we have a lot of questions, I apologize, but I'm going to ask you to look forward. We're, we kind of breezed across 2015, which was a very difficult, troubling. 2014. I mean, 2014, <laughs> what I say? 
did I say 2015? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, which was a very div obviously a very horrific um, year on the international front. As you look into 2015, what are your great worries? Well, wherever ISIL is, they are uh, executing people who refuse to be like them or who can't be like them. <laughs> or they're enslaving <clears throat> women and so forth. So, you know, we are engaged in a multi-year campaign. We are, we are supporting ground actors who need to step up and ultimately, the, over time, the success of this campaign um, requires the Iraqi forces to come together in a way that they haven't succeeded in doing for some time. So it's a very difficult uh, campaign. We're seeing signs, again, that many Sunni want to get out from under ISIL, uh, but the cost of doing so is uh, extreme. And so uh, ISIL keeps me up at night. Um, Assad keeps me up at night uh, because his brutality and disregard for uh, the fate of his people really does seem to know no bounds. Uh, and right now, you know, we, we don't yet have Russia and Iran where they need to be, and we, ne we need them to be in seeing that the longer this conflict goes on, you know, not only the more civilians are, are killed, but the more foreign terrorist fighters gravitate to Syria, the greater the instability mm -hmm. uh, across the region and across the world. So that's within that context. And um, Ebola, which we, we talked about briefly, um, we now, just as I was coming over, I saw on my Blackberry that the WHO has said Sierra Leone now has surpassed Liberia for the number of cases. Mm -hmm. So I think what's been remarkable about the President Obama's leadership and the way in which other countries, once we leveraged our deployment of troops and our real ownership uh, uh, of the Liberian situation in support of the Liberian government um, is what's great about science is you can actually measure the impact. You can see the number of infections come down. You can see people going into treatment sooner and the rate of deaths of those infected going down. And, and so that's been very gratifying in the Liberia context to see American leadership produce such meaningful dividends. And this is a, a, a virus, as you know, as a mother, mm -hmm. you can't, if you're, you know, if you're can't even wipe the, the tears off a child right. because that's, you know, that could be carrying a bowl if you want to take care right. of your other children. I mean, it, right. is, it is the most inhuman form of sickness and death and has the most dehumanizing effects on society. Um, so we've m made these inroads and we can see how it is done. But in Sierra Leone, you know, you're seeing the number of cases uh, going up and up and up and up. Um, and of course, everything we do in Liberia, because it's a, the, the, all these countries border one another, um, is uh, vulnerable, as everything the, the international community and the Guineans are doing in Guinea is vulnerable uh, if we can't get uh, each part of this uh, under control. So that's a kind of early 2015 big priority. We need to bend the curve in Sierra Leone and begin to see the kinds of impacts that we've seen in, in Guinea and Liberia. And where do we go? Final question with Putin in 2015. Well, where, I think what happens there? Again, we're going to continue uh, to put pressure, and uh, we, there have been some signs in, in recent days, again, of the uh, effects uh, of the sanctions, not only in Russia proper, but also uh, in the separatist uh, region. The Ukraine, I just ran into the, our ambassador to Ukraine on, uh, when I was in the State Department earlier today, and um, the one good piece of news out of Ukraine is the Ukrainians have just formed a government. They're, they're getting on with the business of building the state. Um, and we need to not, we need to focus on that as well, uh, because uh, as the, if, if the Ukrainian economy can stabilize, if the democracy can deepen, that is also, again, a powerful antidote uh, to the kind of rule that uh, Putin and his separatists are putting in place in the eastern part of the country and in Crimea. Ambassador Samantha Power, you have your hands full. So it is such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for your candor, for your insight, for your love. Thank you. Thanks.